Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Mr. Travis Hessman, editor Mr. Travis Hessman, editor in chief of Industry Week, to moderate a discussion on advanced manufacturing featuring a panel of global executives. I shall we sit? Okay. Okay. Right here. Right here. Oh, thank you. Welcome. Good luck. <clears throat> All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel. Um, all right, so he, we are here today, um, as was just said, uh, to talk about advanced manufacturing in the U.S. Um, and manufacturing, um, you know, advanced or not, is, is an absolutely vital part uh, of um, conversation about uh, U.S. investment um, right now. Um, and it's also, uh, I think, a particularly complicated uh, discussion to have, um, particularly now. Um, on one side of it, um, I see... Uh, this whole range of opportunities uh, available in the market right now. Um, and this stretches from, um, like I think, the, the, the sci-fi worthy innovations that are coming out of not just Silicon Valley, but startups and traditional manufacturers across the country. Um, we have uh, a full-scale energy boom that's been going on for the better part of a decade that's um, redefining the entire um, uh, global uh, structure. Um, and that we have generations and generations of manufacturing talent here um, that are ready for new uh, opportunities if investments, uh, technology, and tools uh, come their way. But at the same time, um, there are a number of challenges um, faced in this market. Um, and uh, I mean, these go from um, the uh, skilled uh, labor shortages uh, in the US exacerbated by the uh, low unemployment, um, visa issues, um, and the ever-evolving um, trade and tariff uh, conversations. And all of these um, factor in. But between these two points, the opportunities and the challenges, I think that there's a direct line for the opportunities um, for uh, US manufacturing. Um, and it's my job now to get us to that point in the conversation in the next 43 minutes, um, which, you know, no big deal. Um, we should do. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get us um, started right now. And I think the, uh, the best way to do this is to begin with um, introductions. Um, start with myself. Um, as I said at the top, um, Travis Hessman. Um, I'm the chief editor for Industry Week, um, and I'm the moderator today. Um, and uh, Industry Week's uh, very briefly. Um, so uh, for the last 49 years, we've been um, covering uh, manufacturing uh, strategy, trends, and technologies from the executive and the, um, the, the high-level thought leadership um, perspective. And I'm lucky today to be joined by sheer coincidence by a panel of uh, high-level thought leading um, manufacturing executives um, to kick us off. So what we're going to do now, um, we're going to open up the floor um, for each of our um, panelists uh, to introduce themselves, um, and then I'm going to hit them with a series of questions um, to get us into this conversation, starting with the opportunities, uh, going through the challenges, and uh, finding solutions um, in the end. So let's get going. Um, well, sir, um, would you like to uh, yes, start yes, us off? Yeah. Th uh, Travis, thank you. Thank you very, very much for your introduction. And the, uh, it's my great pleasure to be here and to uh, as a panelist, uh, biggest uh, investment event in the United States. Time is limited, so, but I'd like to share, uh, I'd like to briefly share uh, how we are, uh, see the manufacturing uh, evo evolution, e e evo evolving, and what we are doing now to uh, realize the future in the United States. Okay? Hitachi uh, was established in 1910, and uh, just uh, as a uh, motor repair factory for a copper mining startup. Since then, we have never stopped innovating. Today, uh, our diversified portfolio, including infrastructure system, bullet train, IoT solutions, medical devices, and so much more. You can see our total revenue uh, today is 86 billion US dollar, and 13 percent comes from North American market. In North America, uh, total revenue is 11 billion US dollar, and we employ 20,000 uh, people in the United States. Hitachi has over 100 years of experience in OT, operate, operational technology, and more, uh, over 60 years uh, experience in IT. Hitachi is a unique company. 
which holds OT, IT, and products under one roof. This is our biggest strength and the core of our DNA. Let me introduce the IoT platform Lumada. We all, uh, we all know value of the uh, data is increasing. The naming of Lumada comes from illuminating data. Uh, it is a Hitachi's advanced digital solution for turning, that, turning data into insight in order to drive digital innovation. For the manufacturing sector, Lumada consists of the core of platform uh, services, technologies, and its architecture enables a quick development and uh, implementation of advanced digital solution. We would like to uh, create innovation together with all of you. We have recently acquired Salware, which is a major air compressor company in Indiana, and JR Automation, which is a robot system integration company in Michigan. These companies will help us achieve a smooth transition to the robot applied automation. Our long experience in IT, OT, and products uh, area can help accelerate achievement uh, advancement in the United States manufacturing industries. Together with I IoT platform Lumada, we will enable overall optimization of the total value chain for management and maximizing of the customer value in the future. Over the past few years, we have increased our investment in the United States, including M&A, capital investment and R&D investment. In this three years period, Hitachi has invested more than four billion US dollar, and the majority of that is in the manufacturing in the, uh, related industry. In the United States, we see many opportunities for do, uh, doing business, especially in the manufacturing industry. We expect the United States to remain a robust market and open economy environment. In addition, the existing innovation ecosystem is strengthening manufacturing industry, and this is essential for the further growth. Lastly, having a high-skilled workforce is very important. I believe in order to encourage the further investment, a government <coughs> partnership on workforce development is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, and uh, after that, uh, Mr. Uh, Walker, uh, I'd like to have you introduce yourself. Um, this is Don Walker. He's the CEO of uh, Magna International. Sure, thank you. Uh, been with the, in the automotive industry for a little over 40 years now with Magna for a little over 30. Uh, we're pretty diversified. We, uh, we actually design and build complete vehicles under contract. We have about uh, 340 manufacturing plants around the world. 57 of those are in the United States. We, uh, we see U.S. has been a very good place to do business. We invest approximately about $300 million a year in capital uh, on top of R&D and everything else. Uh, overall, it's a, a huge industry. We're, in, we're almost entirely an automotive parts supplier, so we we, we follow our customers for the most part around the world. Excellent, thank you. Um, and also uh, representing um, part of the, uh, the auto industry um, perspective, um, we have Mr. Segal uh, as the chairman of the Motherson Group. Uh, thank you. I think uh, um, like Mr. Walker, Motherson also follows the customer. Uh, our company started in 1975 by my mother and me, and so that's no rocket science why the name is Motherson. Uh, but it imbibes uh, a tremendous amount of trust between this, and that's the same that we replicate with our customers, the countries, and the people who work in Malsan. Uh, we, uh, uh, at the moment, are around 13 billion US on top line. Uh, almost a quarter of that is coming from the, the Americas. Uh, we have about 140,000 people across the globe. We have 271 manufacturing plants. We're primarily a manufacturer, but more on the brick and mortar side. So advanced manufacturing and all that, whatever the customer wants, we do that. So uh, 
that's in very short what Motherson is all about. So. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and finally, Mr. Chin, um, uh, Executive Vice President and Head of uh, Global Development for SK Group. Thank you, Travis. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank uh, Secretary Wilbur Ross, Department of Commerce, as well as the entire Select USA team for uh, inviting us to participate, to be uh, among such great distinguished uh, panelists here. SK uh, is a $140 billion conglomerate that many people probably have not heard because primarily we're in B2B uh, industries and businesses. Um, SK started uh, as a humble uh, textile company in 1953, uh, but it has become a uh, multi-faceted, uh, multi-innovation uh, driven, multi-industry participant around the world. We employ about uh, 100,000 employees, uh, about 75 uh, subsidiaries, uh, and generate over well over $100 billion in revenues uh, each year. In the United States, we um, have about 2,000 employees. We uh, <coughs> operate coast to coast from California to New York uh, in 10 different states. Uh, we're a leader in wireless telecom. We were the pioneers of the CDMA technology in 2G, and now we're pioneering the 5G technology. Uh, we're also the second largest memory semiconductor uh, manufacturer in the world, and uh, we're a leader in energy and petrochemicals uh, industry uh, operating globally, uh, having one of the largest refineries in Asia. Uh, in addition to all that, uh, we're, we've been investing heavily into new industries, and we're beginning to see fruits of that through our launch of our life sciences division uh, in the United States. Um, that, in a nutshell, is SK. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, and all right, uh, so at this point, I'd like to launch into the um, full discussion. I'd like to start with um, some of the opportunities um, that we're talking, um, talking about um, the investment in the US right now. I want to get to the idea of why um, I store that. And we'll, we'll uh, stick with you, sir, uh, Mr. Chin. Um, now, I know that uh, you're investing a lot uh, in the US now uh, and into the future. Um, so I wonder if you can comment on uh, some of those projects and uh, I guess what specifically attracts you to the US market above others. Nice. Um, we started really investing in earnest in 1983 in the United States, but we've really ramped up our investment activities uh, in 2014 uh, after having acquired uh, Hynix Semiconductors, SK, uh, invested $500 million or so to um, uh, build an R&D center in, in California. Uh, in particularly related to developing memory solutions for our customers in the technology sector. In um, 2017, we invested uh, another $450 million or so in acquiring uh, chemical assets in the United States and operating uh, chemical plants throughout uh, different parts of US as well as some other offshore um, <coughs> manufacturing sites. In 2018, uh, we spent about $1.2 billion, probably a little more than that, but that's the figure that I'm uh, comfortable with, uh, in two major uh, acquisitions. One was Ampac Specialty Chemicals that provides uh, ingredients into pharmaceutical companies uh, like Eli Lilly and Johnson & Johnson, as well as uh, we added to some of our financial and operating interests in uh, the shale, gas, and uh, oil in the US, in, in addition to the Plymouth uh, region the Oklahoma stack. And so we have 19 some operating wells right now in, throughout the United States. And then beginning of this year, we uh, decided and broke ground actually uh, in Commerce Georgia, $1.6 billion, $1.7 billion electric vehicle battery plant. And uh, we wanna thank uh, Secretary of Commerce for coming down to Commerce Georgia, helping us break ground and giving us the keynote speech. So. Those were the, some of the major investments. So as you can see, we've uh, both M&A as well as capital investments in R&D and manufacturing. We've become a true um, uh, rooted in America uh, uh, conglomerate. And the primary reasons, um, I'd say that, uh, first of all, US is a, uh, since 2008, probably since the global financial crisis, 
US has had a great run, uh, very steady, uh, no start and stop, steady uh, economic growth and recovery from the financial crisis. And we love stable markets, and that's the place where we want to put our capital to work. Um, we love the uh, transparent regulatory environment that, and, and the rule of law that exists in the US, which is very pro-business for us. Um, we love the innovation. Being in California, as well as in New York, Boston, other places, uh, we love the, uh, the spirit of innovation and, and the investments that go into uh, innovation across the country. Um, to have innovation and, and really get returns on the investments, uh, it's important to have a skilled workforce. And US, with its education system, and all of the sort of the ecosystems of Silicon Valley and other you know, capital-driven uh, free market uh, allows us to be, um, uh, allows us to have freedom to operate and freedom to innovate. Um, probably, and finally, uh, I'd say that um, it's uh, both the, uh, at the uh, federal level and at the state level. There's significant amount of support uh, to the efforts in every sector that we invest in in the United States. And that really helps us get our uh, foot in the door and really establish our roots into the U.S. I hope that wasn't too long of a window when, when no, to answer. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Higashihari, um, I, I just wanted, like, oh, we touch, uh, um, Mr. Chu touched on um, uh, R&D and the talent and the yeah. innovation. That's mm -hmm. kind of become like the traditional resource yeah. here. Um, yeah. Can you tell me how that influences your decision? Okay, I mentioned the acquisition of the uh, uh, survey or the JR automation in order to acquire the uh, product manufacture and also the operating technology uh, supplier. And uh, in, in terms of the IT, information technology, Hitachi Bantara, more than 7,000 uh, talented employees uh, all over the world, to, is already contribute to value to the many U.S. industries. And uh, uh, recently, we launched uh, Santa Clara uh, Square. <coughs> it is a cutting-edge uh, R&D facilities. Mm -hmm. In that facility, uh, Hitachi and its customers uh, can uh, uh, analyze uh, challenges and the visual challenges and uh, create a new uh, solution, feasible solution, mm -hmm. through co-creation. Uh, co in such a manner, Hitachi already is received and the uh, light, light on the uh, you know, benefits of the uh, ta talent ecosystem here. But the important thing, we have to uh, actively develop such kind of the, uh, talent ecosystem uh, in the focus on the long-term sustainability. This is very important. So Hitachi invest, uh, heavily invested in such kind of the American workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, Hitachi sites, at the Hitachi site in Georgia, uh, Michigan, and the Kentucky, and other uh, places across the nation, uh, we are very aware of working with a close relation with a university, or technical school, or even high school on STEM uh, initiative. Right. So uh, it is a critical that the uh, uh, public, public and uh, uh, yeah, private and the public sector play their role mm -hmm. uh, to, and uh, we we, sh we can you know keep growing such kind of the uh, talent ecosystem. That is important. Excellent. Um, and Mr. Walker, um, if we could um, I, I know, expand about that on a, on a broader level, just talking about the, the U.S. Um, uh, uh, business environment and the auto manufacturing heritage here. How does that play into, into your business models throughout the U.S.? Sure. I think, and let me start off by saying I think this is a really important topic, and I'm glad to see that people are talking about investment because I personally think that if you want to raise the standard of living for people in the country, you need to have manufacturing. And manufacturing is not uh, dirty, low, low paying jobs. It's, uh, it's creating something and being a productive country. Uh, I'm going to make a comment maybe later on trade. But if you, if you look at the uh, 
the average person is not going to be working in, in software. We need to be creating jobs. In the automotive industry, which is the, I might be biased, it's the highest tech industry in the world. It has the most advanced software. You look at the new battery technology. We're involved in autonomous driving technology, which is extremely complicated, as well as electrification of vehicles, which is a lot of new technologies. So I think the, the idea to try and have a competitive area for companies, and it was interesting to talk about uh, behind, before we came out here, what, what, what's the difference between the U.S. and other areas? I think the U.S. is very supportive uh, of investment. They're very helpful, uh, good skilled workforce here. And I think the, the, the view that manufacturing to create jobs and the spin-off benefits uh, is so important, it, it's really a pleasure to see that. If you look at uh, the spin-off benefits to, from, from the area we're in, in R&D, uh, capital investment, logistics, it goes on and on. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big area. The, uh, I think that some of the, uh, the positive areas that we see, uh, I, I mentioned them, I think some of the challenges we, we, we see is, uh, I look at, although we're a Canadian-based com uh, company, we have more R&D, engineering, and employees and facilities in the States than we do in Canada. But I look at the NAFTA region in the automotive industry as a trading region. And it, and it has to be competitive versus Europe as a region, versus China as a region, and versus the rest of Asia as a region. And we need to be really careful when we're negotiating things like USMCA, which needs to be passed because we need certainty if we're going to put long-term assets in the ground. But we also need access to relatively low labor rate to make things that nobody in North America, or no, nobody in, in the U.S. wants to make. That's why Mexico's, Mexico is good to have to to be a feeder, to make the, the, the vehicle competitive around the world. So overall, I think the, the, we need to look at the big picture, have stability, have really clear work rules. I understand the, the, what, what the need is to make sure that there's not unfair trade practices, mm -hmm. uh, and I would support that. But we need to have stability, because uh, when we invest the billions of dollars that we're investing every year, those are long-term assets. We need to know we're going to get a return on them. Excellent. Yeah, we're going, to, uh, we're going to bounce back to that one. That's a, um, a big, big topic um, that I'd like to take on head on uh, in this conversation. But since we started getting into the thorny stuff, uh, Mr. Sabel, uh, I'd like to throw uh, one to you. Um, so we talked about um, the advantages um, all the way uh, around uh, for the U.S. environment, um, but uh, I think it's, we need to talk about the challenges as well. Um, and I'm looking at your uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama plant uh, in particular, um, and coming into that, and the challenges for, um, for that particular reason in getting it staffed with the, uh, the engineers and the skilled labor um, that you need to do it. Could you talk about some of the challenges to, um, that project has um, posed? Yeah, well, we are going through it at the moment, and um, the, the ability of the people to catch the nuances, what the automotive uh, um, customers expect and take it for granted. So we've set up a lot of greenfield plants all over the world. But in, uh, in Tuscaloosa, we, we, of course, very grateful to the governments and uh, the local governments. They really supported as much as they could. But we found that the uh, workforce was not so uh, well trained or inclined to move in that direction. So uh, the ability was to get people to come into uh, this thing, help them to train up better, uh, to come up to the expectations of what uh, productivity and uh, quality, all these particular things are, safety, of course, is very, very important. So uh, we did face a lot of challenges there, but together with the government, we could explain to them that we need the help, and they came up over there. But I think when countries give up uh, manufacturing and mm -hmm. go for uh, outsourcing, you know, buying it cheaper outside, I think one big thing is their own workforce in, in, in that country are uh, sort of, uh, they need tremendous amount of training. And this is required in every aspect of uh, the industry, even if it's low brick and mortar, right, going up to the most advanced manufacturing. So I think the ability of the country has to be to be able to provide that training. Of course, the governments and the colleges and all these things are doing it, but still, the global expertise must come in. So I think in that sense, uh, uh, we would hope that uh, you know, US would look at this as an important part. 
But uh, in the meantime, as a follow-up question, uh, in the meantime, what would you recommend um, like the, the best path forward for other companies who found themselves in this same position that are looking at US investments and have these uh, talent issues? I think the uh, work-related uh, 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 permissions and uh, gr uh, granting of visas and all these particular things are vital because uh, the world can't wait for uh, a product coming from America with uh, not having very skilled uh, uh, capabilities over there. So if you have huge automation, that probably helps. But uh, the kind of products that we make don't have too much of automation either. So I think it's a good mixture. It's understanding the industry's need and then reacting to that. Right. Excellent. Um, OK, good. Mr. Walker. Um, if we could um, return over to you. Um, you started the conversation there about um, uh, NAFTA um, and um, the US um, environment. Could you expand on that a little bit more um, to say um, uh, what, the, um, what the current environment um, really meets, means to business um, trying to operate across uh, North America? Well, I was very happy to see that the tariffs were dropped between within NAFTA between Mexico and Canada for aluminum and steel. I think that was actually hurting our U.S. plants more than, than anything else. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I really believe that NAFTA as a trading region needs to be competitive and we need to be working together. So uh, uh, the, the passing as quickly as possible of the U.S. MCA in, uh, is critical. Uh, I know a lot of people are in agreement with that. I just hope it gets through the process. Um, I won't comment uh, certainly on, on any new tariff with Mexico. That would be extremely uh, harmful to the automotive industry because anything that drives up the cost of the components means that the cost of the vehicle gets more expensive, which means other trading regions are more competitive and then you lose market share. Uh, I, think, I think that the challenge will be now in, in um, whether it's trade with China or the USMCA, is we need to make sure that the details of the agreement are ironed out. Because if you look at something like regional value content in the automotive industry, and there's a labor value content of $16 per hour, if we have to now start doing a lot of non-value-added bureaucratic tracking and reporting uh, or, or tracking for the quotas uh, that are in the USMCA, again, it just is a lot of extra cost. It makes us less competitive as a trading area and the areas outside of, of NAFTA, which are dying for investment and really want to support, as an example, the automotive industry, anything we do that drives our costs up will make us less competitive, sell less, less jobs and uh, revenue to the government. So I think just passing the USMCA and getting the details simplified is a really important next step. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, then Mr. Uh, Mr. Chen, I want to um, bring it back to you. Um, now, I think everybody on the panel so far has talked about um, skilled labor um, and the challenges um, populating the plant. Um, we talked a couple of weeks ago about your, um, uh, the battery plant uh, in Georgia. Um, and going into that region, um, very low uh, unemployment um, with the, um, the uh, usual skills gap issues uh, of the US. But it seemed like you were able to to make it through that. And I think that's a valuable lesson um, to have because yes. you know, we all talk about the skills gap. We talk about it endlessly. Um, but I think um, what's really valuable is to find solutions that really work uh, in the industry. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell that story and just um, the, uh, the issues that you, um, you discovered there and, and how you were able to work through them. I see. Um, as it relates to the, um, the Commerce Georgia uh, electric vehicle battery plant, uh, the process was pretty intense and long. Uh, first of all, we, we were looking at 20 different sites uh, throughout the United States. And it was really tough because uh, as we look at investing that kind of money and putting our roots down, obviously we look for certain things. Um, first of all, our customers have to be there mm -hmm. um, nearby. Number two, uh, the state or the local area that we're looking to invest in and set, our, set ourselves up has to have pro-business policies um, and then skilled workforce. But I think really important, what's important is having people in local, state, even at the, at the federal level, be very supportive and active in helping us identify the issues and work through them. For the Georgia plant, uh, it was a great experience because once we made the decision, the difficult decision to go to Georgia, um, 
it was really a great experience because first of all, we managed to um, uh, do a lot of research with the help of Department of Commerce as well as uh, uh, the local governments in Georgia um, about the sort of steady stream of well-educated workforce. Uh, and every state, we realized, would have some of the uh, skills gaps and so on, but Georgia has a great education system already and produces great uh, workforce overall. Uh, but there are also specific programs uh, that uh, Georgia has, one of which is uh, what's called the Quick Start Program, and it's a program that Georgia runs that um, basically helps investors like us uh, match um, or, or shall I say, um, locate, screen, um, help hire, as well as train um, potential employees uh, for a, a, a battery plant like ours. And working actively hand in hand with uh, the uh, Georgia government was really helpful for us mm -hmm. in um, being able to finalize our plans and, and break ground. And so, I think, as I mentioned, it's that support system and that active desire on the part, because almost everyone's pro-business. Everybody wants investments in their country and their state, but that sort of uh, support system is essential uh, for us to make the decision and then to put money into the ground mm -hmm. and, and begin a successful uh, campaign. Excellent, thank you. Um, Mr. Higashihara, um, I just wondered, um, so at the beginning of this, you, you really spelled out your vision for the future mm -hmm. of manufacturing. Uh, and with the investment numbers you're talking about, mm -hmm. it's clear that the U.S. plays a big um, part in that. Um, I, I, I guess just to close out this part of the conversation, okay. could you highlight some, some of the specific uh, opportunities that you see here for that uh, advanced manufacturing mm -hmm. sector? Ju judging from the U U.S. You know, uh, market status and the talent, I think uh, U.S. is the uh, most suitable place to build the uh, uh, future of the manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And uh, keyword, two keywords, one is digitalization. Another one is the, you know, uh, overall uh, optimization. These two are the keywords. And, you know, uh, everything will be connected, such as a production line, uh, 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 you know, e-commerce and the supply chain or other, you know, uh, logistics. These are value chain, all, all connected. And the, we can, you know, uh, you know, develop the overall optimization system. And there is a three step. One is, a, you know, uh, manufacturing process-based optimization. Mm -hmm. Next stage is a, a factory, factory-based uh, optimization. Third one is a multiple factory, total, you know, uh, overall, you know, optimization. I introduced uh, Hitachi's Lumada. It is a, we, we can uh, realize a, a step by step improvement by using Lumada, uh, factory base and the large factory base. So, but uh, in order to establish this kind of the uh, total system, we need a co creation. Uh, you know, collaborate with the customers. So uh, I think the, it is important to uh, share the, what is the issues and together with uh, uh, management and the, uh, discuss, visualize, and the, uh, find a feasible you know, solution by using digitalization. Beautiful. All right, excellent. Um, and uh, from here, the, the remaining five minutes and 19 seconds uh, that we have, I want to I divide our time um, with everybody answering uh, one question, um, which is what's going to drive uh, a future investment um, in manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S.? Um, and I, I guess, uh, Mr. Segal, if we could start there. Uh, so we're 99% OEM suppliers. So definitely, as my customers are going to come more and more into U.S., because the wonderful market and the conditions here, uh, definitely our group is going to focus more on US. Uh, all over the globe, we're in 41 countries, but we have never, uh, we don't like to export too much. We are very local producers. Um, so in, in that sense, I think the first most important thing is that my customers are very, very inclined to be here in US, and hence we'll be more on that. Secondly, 
Uh, we are acquisitive companies. We acquire a lot of companies. And that's another opportunity that we have in USA. So uh, we've done 22 acquisitions already up till now and always looking for more. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, Mr. Higashihari, yeah. the same question. Okay. <clears throat> oh, uh, you know, when we look around the you know, US market, the BSO issue is the uh, aging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So uh, Hitachi would like to, uh, I already mentioned that Hitachi already have experience, more than 100 years OT and products and also the uh, 60, more than 60 years you know, IT. So combining IT, OT products, uh, we can provide the intelligent uh, infrastructure system, such as the railway, mm -hmm. energy, or other you know, uh, industry infrastructure, and so on. So, uh, and uh, we'd like to, uh, also, we'd like to have a three value is very important. One is a social value economical value, uh, no, no, environmental value, economical value. These three values are very important. So we'd like to promote social innovation, we call it so-called social innovation business. We'd like to, to improve the quality of life for Americans. Also, with the uh, adding, while the adding the customer's value uh, <coughs> in the United States. That is our expectation. Yeah. Well, we'll take it, thank you. Um, Mr. Walker, uh, same question. I think the long-term view, as I said earlier, the importance of manufacturing to the standard of living and, and being able to create jobs for people is really important. So I think the, the environment around stability, uh, trade, uh, educating in, in the STEM, so we have good technical people. Uh, I think if we continue to focus on that in the U.S., then, then it'll be a good place to invest. There's a lot going on now, uh, in certainly in, in in my history of over 40 years, in the last 12 to 24 months, there's been more changes, potential changes going on. So the quicker we get stability in trade and tariff and investment, uh, and I'm not saying it, it's wrong, but we just need, the U.S. has got to make sure they have a good long-term vision because they're up against competitors that have a very long-term vision and make sure they get it right, get it stable, uh, and have a workforce here, and I think people will continue to invest. But as was already said, in our, our business, we, we follow the automotive uh, assemblers for the most part, so you need to attract those people here and make sure that uh, everything isn't built offshore and shipped in. Excellent. Uh, and Mr. Chin, um, same question. Um, the, uh, what, what will drive, from your perspective, uh, future investment in U.S. manufacturing? Yes, in simple terms, it's more of the same, more of what made uh, America um, and participants in the, the expansion of economy uh, in the U.S. Uh, successful. Uh, it's uh, freedom to operate for uh, multinational companies, whether they're based in U.S. or based in South Korea or other places. Uh, investment into workforce, um, I think, Things like uh, Pledge to America's Workers, uh, those types of programs are really good programs to um, highlight the commitment to uh, developing the workforce in the United States. Uh, and then many things that Don's already mentioned, which is stability, um, uh, protection of, uh, global protection of intellectual property rights, mm -hmm. um, and making sure that um, America is truly open for business as we hear often at forums yeah. like this. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you. Um, uh, gentlemen, um, I think this was a, a fantastic conversation, um, and uh, we timed that out perfectly, um, so we're there. So thank you, uh, everyone out there, for listening in today, and thank you, um, Select USA, for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.